Good morning. And welcome to Trinity Community Church. Good morning, Martin. Some notices, rather a lot of notices before we begin. Tonight at 5 p.m. in St. James the Less, you've an opportunity to worship God and learn new songs around the world. Uh, that's at 5 p.m. in St. James tonight. Tonight at 7.15 p.m. in the hall, uh, we have our normal prayer meeting. Everyone is welcome to that. And on Saturday, that's this Saturday coming, you can come and help clear up and clean up stairs in the church. That's the gallery and the rooms to the side. And if you want to contact Joan or just turn up any time after 10 a.m., you'd be very welcome. The next ecumenical prayer meeting will be on Monday, 28th August. That's next Monday in Sacred Heart Church at 7.30 p.m. On Sunday, the 3rd of September, there's a joint service with the North Kirk in Pennycook, uh, in the North Kirk. And um, if you come here, there won't be a service. So fix that firmly in your calendars. Uh, and I'll be speaking uh, on growing young, empathizing with people. Messy Church starts a new season that afternoon, and also on the 3rd of September, there is a Midlothian Church's Praise Night, and that's in Lonehead Church at 7 p.m., and the speaker will be Pamela Kennedy, who is a pioneer minister near Peebles. Youth Alpha starts on Tuesday, 5th September at 7 o'clock. Uh, there is food and a, a chance to get to know each other. It's aimed at people who are 11 to 18, but we'd welcome you if you're slightly outside uh, these ages. Um, I'm not going to make a comment. <laughs> if you contact Anne Sire or Caroline Toms. Some sad news. Uh, Mr. Bobby B. of Rullian Road has died. He's the husband of Myra, who worships with us regularly. And the funeral will be in the main chapel at Morton Hall, on Tuesday, August 29th at 11 a.m. And lastly, we hope you'll join us after the service for a bowl of soup and tea or coffee. And everybody's welcome. You don't need a ticket. It's not necessary. So please come along for that. Let's pause for a moment and just quieten our minds as we come into God's presence, leave behind all the concerns of the week. Please join together in our call to worship. It's based on words from Psalm 36. You, O Lord, have the fountain of life that quenches our thirst. Your light has opened our eyes and awakened our souls. Let's worship God together. Let's sing all my days. Let us come to God in prayer. We thank you, Lord, that you are our loving Heavenly Father. We thank you that your purpose is to give people life. And you've created life in the middle of this vast universe. And you've renewed that life forever in the person of your Son, Jesus, risen from the dead. And so we come with joy before you to worship you, to adore you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God blessed forever. You are greater than we can imagine. 
the one who is, who was, and is to come. We cannot contain you within our imagination, let alone in our worship. For you are very great, and you are very good. And we thank you that you love us, and that is why Jesus came to show us you and to die instead of us to set us free from all our sins. We come as we are wearing our frail humanity which Jesus took upon himself to wear. Forgive us for what we've done wrong or anything we failed to do we fail to do what's right. We come not to wallow in guilt, but to admit our wrongdoing so that you can deal with it. And we take the opportunity to tell you about anything that afflicts our spirit now in the quiet. Father, help us to change. Help us to repent by the wisdom of your word and by the power of your spirit. Come to us now. Come to us as your people. Come to us as we reflect on things in the service which are taught us in, in Holy Scripture. According to your kind and gracious purpose for us and with us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Supposing you wanted to send a message to a group of churches, how would you do it? Any ideas, anyone? Email. Another idea. Sorry? Word of mouth. That's, that's an acceptable answer as well. Telephone, WhatsApp. Well, I, I thought of two of these answers. I thought you might send an email, and I thought of, of a WhatsApp group. Uh, and if you don't know what WhatsApp group is, we have one for Gather on the Green. Um, please ask someone later. But if you lived in the first century, and you don't have all of these things, how would you do it? Now, I had a bit of difficulty finding someone who, uh, people who looked like they came from the first century. And so you uh, apologize if they all look somewhat the same. Well, one of the things you could do is send a circular letter. Now, that has nothing to do with the shape of the letter. It doesn't mean it's round in shape. It means it's sent round everybody and possibly copied down and then it's sent on to the next church. That's what's happening in our Bible reading today. John, who's writing down this letter, which is called Revelation in the Bible, was on the island of Patmos in the eastern Mediterranean. And you might think, oh, that looks a nice place. I'll go there next summer. But he is not on a summer holiday. He's been sent there because the people in charge of the Roman Empire at that time are trying to stop him speaking to people about Jesus. They're trying to stop him saying that this isn't the way you should live. And God has provided a way of escape from that through Jesus. And he has a list of churches that he's been told to send his, his letter to that is actually a bit of a book. And these churches are all on the road that the person who's carrying it would take. It would take him a long time, but that's the way he would go. The person who's told him to send this letter is Jesus. 
And John describes Jesus in today's reading, but it's a description that would look really weird if you tried to draw a picture of it. Though it hasn't stopped people trying to draw it. It's both something that John saw, Jesus dressed like a king, and which he thought and prayed about, and some of these thoughts he put into pictures. If we try to imagine them all together as a single picture, then it doesn't make sense to us. Because these images are not meant to work that way. But if we think about them separately, and think about how these word pictures have been used before in the Bible, they eventually make sense to us. I'll give you an example. This is from the, the Bam Berber apocalypse, which comes from about the year 1000. The words which Jesus speaks turn into a sword coming out of his mouth. That means the words that Jesus speaks are true and wise and right. They don't actually harm us. There's no bloodshed involved in that way. But they cut right into us, metaphorically speaking. They, they cut right into us. In other words, they show us exactly what's wrong with us. And they also have the power, quite strangely, to make things better for us if we pay attention to what Jesus is saying. And the first message that John, that Jesus wants John to send is for a church in a city that's across from the island of Patmos called Ephesus. And that's the place that the person carrying the letter would arrive at first. Now, there's one word picture that's been used again and again in the Bible, and it's also used at the end of this message in Ephesus. Listen out for it in the, the reading later. That's the picture of the tree of life. And we're going to watch a video about that now. The story of the Bible begins in a garden where God and humans live together. And the biblical authors want us to see this garden as a type of temple. The top is the most sacred place, the Holy of Holies, where God's presence is most intense. And that's where we find the tree of life. So what's this tree all about? Well, it represents God's own life and creative power that is made available to others. In fact, God's first command is that humans eat from all of the trees, including this one. So you're ingesting God's own life. That sounds intense. Yeah, this meal transforms the one who eats it, or in the words of the story, it leads to eternal life. Okay, but on the way to the tree of life, the humans have to pass by another tree called the tree of knowing good and bad. And God says that eating from this tree will kill you. How does it do that? Well, it represents taking the authority to do what is good in your own eyes. And when humans do that, it leads to broken relationships, violence, and death. And so here's the thing. Both trees look beautiful, but one of them is a false tree of life. And the humans take from this false tree of life. And they're exiled from the garden for good. Which raises the question, can anyone ever get back to the tree of life? Well, later on in the story, we meet a man named Moses, and he encounters God in a desert tree on top of a mountain. Oh, you mean the burning bush, where Moses is told that he's standing on holy ground. Yeah, it's a plant on a mountain radiating with God's life and power, just like the tree of life. And God tells Moses, bring your people up to this mountain so we can form a partnership. And this partnership will force them to make a choice. Will they follow gods of their own making or receive life from the true God? And in this story, they give their allegiance to an idol. 
and it's just the first of many. The story goes on to show generation after generation choosing gods of their own making. And these idols were usually placed on tall hills like beautiful trees. But they're false trees of life that lead the people into self-destruction, exile, and death. It's like death's grip on us is too strong to resist. Is there any hope? Well, let's turn now to the story of Jesus. He came to announce that God's eternal life was available once again through him. So Jesus thinks of himself as the tree of life. Yes, this is what he meant when he claimed to be the vine that brings God's life into the world. And Jesus invited people to eat from him. Yeah, he was inviting people to trust him and be transformed by his life. But Jesus also exposed how corrupt humans are, how much they love false trees of life. And so Jesus presented people with a new choice between life or death. And this time, they don't just choose death. They also chose to attack the one who sustains all of life. Yes, Jesus is led up to the top of a hill where he dies upon a tree. The cross is the sad and violent result of humanity's desire to do what is good in our own eyes. The tree of life has been overcome by the power of death. Well, it seemed that way. But Jesus said that he was a seed of God's life that would die in the ground, but then grow into a plant that would bear much fruit. So to defeat death, Jesus went through it. And now this new tree of life stands before us all. We can eat from it, but it will mean passing through death like Jesus, allowing our old way of being human to die. So that a new humanity can grow in its place. Yes, Jesus said he is the vine and we are his branches. So not only do you eat from this tree, you're invited to become a part of it, helping produce its fruit so that his life and love can spread through us to others. And so the story of the Bible ends in a new garden which is also a kind of temple, with the tree of life at its center, providing healing and life forever to all who choose to eat from it. Let's sing together. Two songs, all heaven declares, followed by, I will offer up my life in spirit and truth. I am John, and I am your brother in Christ. We are together in Jesus, and we share in these things, in suffering, in the kingdom, and in patience. I was on the island of Patmos because I had preached God's message and the truth about Jesus. On the Lord's day, the Spirit took control of me. I heard a loud voice behind me that sounded like a trumpet. The voice said, write what you see and send the book to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned to see who was talking to me. When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. I saw someone among the lampstands who was like a son of man. He was dressed in a long robe. He had a gold band around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like the flames of fire. His feet were like bronze that glows hot in a furnace. His voice was like the noise of flooding water. He held seven stars in his right hand. A sharp two-edged sword came out of his mouth. He looked like the sun shining at its brightest time. When I saw him, I fell down at his feet like a dead man. He put his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the God, the one who lives. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever and I hold the keys of death and where the dead are. So write the things you see, what is now and what will happen later. Here is the hidden meaning of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands that you saw. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Write this to the angel of the church in Ephesus. 
The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands says this to you. I know what you do. You work hard and you never give up. I know that you do not accept evil people. You have tested those who say that they are apostles, but really they are not. You found that they are liars. You continue to serve me. You have suffered troubles for my name, and you have not given up. But I have this against you. You have left the love, love you had in the beginning. So remember where you were before you fell. Change your hearts and do not do what you did at first. If you do not change, I will come to you. I will take away your lampstand from its place. But there is something you do that is right. You hate what the Nicolaitans do as much as I. Every person who has ears should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who wins the victory, I will give the right to eat the fruit from the tree of life. The tree is in the garden of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, please send your Holy Spirit to me as I speak and to all of us as we listen and think about these things so that you may be glorified in your word through the scriptures. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. What's a message to someone else's church got to do with me? The answer is something we heard in the holiday club service. Remember, says Jesus. Do you remember it? It's only a few weeks ago. If you've got ears, you've got ears, so use them. I don't remember it so well. Pay attention to what God is telling you. Or as it is in John's version, every person who has ears should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. That means even if you're not in leadership in the church in Ephesus, if you're one of the other churches in the Roman province of Asia, and even if you're listening hundreds of years later, then God has something to say to you through this. This is what Jesus said through John to the other churches in Asia Minor. Write this to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Now, where was Ephesus? It was a port city. It's now part of modern-day Turkey. It's now abandoned. And it had about a quarter of a million people living there at the time that John wrote. And though because the harbor silted up and the city was abandoned, it's now six miles from the coast. And it was home to one of the so-called seven wonders of the ancient world. It was just outside the city. It was the temple of Artemis of Ephesus. And it was a very large site. It was about four times the size of the Parthenon in Athens. And that's all that remains of it today. So it was a big center of pagan worship and of superstition. And a lot went on under the auspices of that temple, which was completely antithetical to Jesus and his church. And it was also a place where in AD 90, a temple was built to honor Domitian as, as the God Emperor. 
where the worship of imperial Rome was encouraged. And so it's a, not only a major pagan site, it's a very wealthy city. And it has commercial, religious, ethnic and political tensions which go with that. And needless to say, it's a hard place to be a Christian. What does John mean by the angel of the church? I think it doesn't mean anyone in the church's leadership, although it has been interpreted that way in the past. There are lots of angels in Revelation, and they tend to be real angels. In Hebrews chapter 1, the author speaks of the role of angels. He says, all angels are spirits who serve, and God sends them to serve those who will receive salvation. In the book of Daniel, we read about angels who are in charge of nations. And in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus speaks about his little ones having angels in heaven. So maybe, though we can't construct a, a full angelology from this, maybe there's an angel watching over each church. But it's plain to see that whoever the angel might be, the comments Jesus makes to each church are addressed to ordinary people in that church. Perhaps it's a reminder that churches aren't just private clubs of people with similar beliefs. You know, we can treat the church in that way. We say, I, I'm a Christian, so I, I come along to church. And that's the wrong way to think about it. The church is a key part of the plan and purpose of God for the planet. I'm talking about the whole church. And if things are going wrong in a local church, the significance isn't just local. It's universal. It's cosmic. Because it's through the church that God is putting his plan of salvation in Jesus into action. That's the New Testament teaching. And that's what Revelation is saying as a whole. Your struggles as Christians and as churches are part of something much bigger. Your life together isn't just of earthly significance. It has a heavenly dimension. It's God's work. I wonder if that affects you when you come into church. Or, when you, or maybe you're thinking about what you're going to be doing later in the afternoon. If you're thinking that this is a place in which God's people gather. A place in which they find their identity. And a place in which we're all encouraged to be part of the work that God is doing in the world. Now, there are seven stars and seven golden lampstands. And here John explains his pictures at the end of chapter 1. The seven lampstands, he says, are the seven churches, and the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And that's what Jesus says. It's a reminder that Jesus is involved with his church. Jesus holds the seven stars in his right hand. And it's a word which means grips. And he walks among the seven golden lampstands. There's a very famous lampstand that was once in the temple until Titus took it away. And this is a representation of it from the arch, the triumphal arch of Titus in Rome. But this these lampstands which Jesus has 
walking among indicate not a single worship place like the temple which you had to travel up to, but a scattered communities all over the place, but with a unity in Christ who's among them and over them and who grips them in his hand. Jesus holds the angels of the churches. He's present and aware. And he walks among the churches. He's in control. He's present there. And he's aware of what they're all doing. And he begins his personal message to Ephesus with the words, I know. Jesus knows the good and the bad about us. Jesus knows everything that we have brought today and more besides. And out of that knowledge, out of that awareness, comes these seven messages to the church. I've been thinking of some ways to describe them to you. In some ways, they're a performance report. For example, a school report or a work assessment. This is actually uh, the school report of Roald Dahl, the, the children's author, though he wasn't a children's author at the time. And it says, English, very fair. <laughs> Which I have trouble working out whether that's good or whether that's bad. And they also contain messages of encouragement. Have you ever got a card or an email or a text message or whatever or word of mouth that helps you keep going? That someone encourages you? And also you can view them as orders from a commander in a war zone because it's a tough place, Ephesus, to be in. And these are orders from the commander-in-chief, Jesus our King. And by the close of the message, it's evident there's a struggle going on. I suggest we just take the performance report, and that's, I'm going to break it down into the positive comments. Now, in all the management books, they say, start off with the positive. But Jesus isn't cynical about this. He really wants to say some positive things about his church in Ephesus. And then the bits you could do better. Something that needs improvement. And then there's urgent action to be taken. First of all, the positive comments. I find this site on, on the internet, a hundred report card comments you can use now. It's a, it's a resource for teachers. And so if you look that up, you'll know whether your teacher has looked it up as well. But Jesus says positively, you work hard and you never give up. He says, I know what you do. You work hard and you never give up. I know that you don't accept evil people. You've tested those who say that they're apostles but really aren't. You've found out that they're liars. You continue to serve me and you've suffered troubles for my name. And you haven't given up. That would be a tremendously encouraging to the people of Ephesus, to the church in Ephesus. If this church had a Facebook page or a magazine, you'd have a fair idea they were active and involved. And I'm talking about the church in Ephesus, but I'm also talking about Trinity. Now, the early church was both blessed and plagued with traveling evangelists and teachers 
What do I mean by that? Some of them were, were genuine Christians and they're celebrated. They were a blessing to the church. And some of them were just con artists. And they were a plague on the churches. Paul in 2 Timothy talks about people of corrupt mind and counterfeit faith. And the Ephesians Christians, the Ephesian Christians tested these people and exposed the false ones for what they were. By what these people said, no doubt, but also crucially, how they behaved. You remember Jesus saying, Beware of false prophets. He says it in Matthew 7. They come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly they're ravenous wolves. <laughs> it's a wolf pretending to be a sheep. It's not what they actually look like, but it's what Jesus pictures them as being like. And he says you will know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns, he says, or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. They had to deal with people who said they were Christians, but were just in it for what they could get out of it. And they lived in a difficult situation in Ephesus, but Jesus' words are genuine towards them. You continue to serve me. You've suffered troubles for my name, and you haven't given up. You'd probably think that meant everything was okay. If you can live life as a Christian in a pressure cooker like Ephesus, then that's something. And yet, there was something that needed attention. I have this against you. You've left the love that you had in the beginning. Now you can interpret that in two ways. The first way is that they've left the love that they had for Christ, for God. And they've left, the second way is that they've left the love that they had for each other. And of course the two are connected. Jesus was asked, which commandment is the greatest? Which is the first of all? And the answer was, that came back to him was, the first is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself, and there is no other commandment greater than these. John, writing to Christians in, in possibly these very same churches, says this. This is from 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who don't love a brother or sister whom they've seen can't love God whom they've not seen. Then he drives the point firmly, tying it home to Jesus' words. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God 
must love their brothers and sisters also. I'm going to assume that it's probably both love for God and each other that they've let go. It probably shows up in their attitudes to each other. Sometimes that happens in churches. People who had stood strong throughout Europe for important biblical truths and over problems in the church of the time sometimes had terrible disagreements over secondary issues. It was true on a personal level. It became enshrined in different confessional identities in different parts of Europe. And churches that go on, def that go from defending essential Christian truths sometimes become tight and hard and narrow. Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 is telling the people how essential love is to the Christian's action. He says you can become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal without it. Now he's not talking about an undiscriminate, sorry, as one commentator puts it, who's obviously got more control of his mouth than I do, he calls it an undiscriminating amiability, which is hard to say. But you know, you're, you're, you're sort of nice to everybody. And that's, that's good, but it's not really praiseworthy. It isn't really loving. Sometimes you've got to tell other people hard truths. And what does Jesus say is needed? There's urgent action to be taken. If you like three-point sermons, it's remember, repent, and redo. So remember where you were before you fell. Change your hearts. Undergo a complete change of heart and mind and do what you did at first. In other words, keep in mind what you used to be and take decisive action to turn back to God. Have a complete change of mind. Have a radical redirection of your entire life and learn to live the way you used to live. And Jesus is, is here making an ultimatum in some ways. Because if they won't act, then Jesus will. If you don't change, I'm coming to you and I'll take your lampstand away from its place. Churches that don't bear the light of Jesus with the love of Jesus, become useless and empty, even if they're still here, and sometimes are removed. I'm on the final page now. Jesus has some more positive comments for them. But there's something you do that's right. You hate what the Nicolaitans do as much as I. Now, who are these people? Now, we don't know very much about them. There's been a lot of speculation. Basically, the New Testament church had different sorts of people trying to lead them astray. There were the, the legalists who wanted the church to tighten up and take on the entire Jewish law. And they, they had radically underestimated the difference made by Jesus. And then there were the, the loosen up people 
the no law people. And it's probably those that the Nicolaitans are. Because the only other place they're mentioned in Scripture is in one of the other letters to the churches. And they said, well, if you want to go to a party in a pagan temple, what's the harm in that? It's just a little bit of fun. If you want to indulge in sexual behavior like the pagans, then hmm, why not do that? And Jesus is saying to his church, you hate what they do as much as I do. Now, he's not saying hate the Nicolaitans. He's not saying hate the people. He's saying hate what they do. And he's saying that as a measure of a church that we love people, but we hate sometimes what they do, rather than having an undiscriminating amiability. And finally, there's a promise to people in a war zone. To him who wins the victory, I'll give the right to eat the fruit from the tree of life. That tree is in the garden of God, literally the paradise of God. There's a battle going on in, Ever in Ephesus and in the book of Revelation and in the world today. And ostensibly it's between Christ and Caesar. But it's actually not just that. It's between God and Satan. And the victory that, that Revelation holds out, that John holds out to people, is not by force of arms of being stronger in that way than Caesar. It's by trust in God. And it says in Revelation 12, but they, they've conquered him, that Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they did not cling to life even in the face of death. John begins his letter by saying, we're together in Jesus and we share in these things, in suffering in the kingdom and in patient endurance. That's among the things which we're called to be as a church, to endure patiently as Jesus did. And we're promised if we do that, then we'll have access to the tree of life of access to all that God is. And that's the difference finally between life and death for us. Let's pray. Father, you know sometimes we go through dry patches in our Christian life. And you know about these things. And you know if we come and confess it to you and, and anything that's wrong in our lives. And if we seek you, because these dry patches sometimes encourage us to burrow more deeply into your word, to burrow more deeply into devotional literature, which can can bring us back to a place we once inhabited but now we've fallen away from. Or maybe that we don't exhibit Christian love anymore. We kind of fake it. But Father, we thank you that you know about these things. You know all of them, even as Jesus says he knows about his church in Ephesus. So, Father, have mercy on us. 
Help us to do the things that you recommend. Help us not to forget about this. Help us to do the things which you are calling us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing now, I need thee every hour. Heavenly Father, accept the worship we offer in Jesus' name at the start of this fresh week. Blend it into the worship of the whole church in heaven and across the world today. Accept also our offerings of money along with the time and the talents you have given each one of us. Use all of these to build up your kingdom of grace and love, both here and through the work of others, wherever there is need of it in the world. We heard the word, listen, in our scripture this morning, and it's a robust and often repeated imperative, Lord. So help us as a congregation, as a presbytery, as a church, to listen intently to what the Spirit is saying to the churches in these difficult days of ours, and help us to trustingly obey. We pray especially for guidance as we carry the gospel out along new paths and using new ways and styles of communicating it. This is serious work. But please, God, let us also find in it joy, a sense of excitement, maybe even adventure. Bless all the new initiatives within congregations at the start of what, rightly or wrongly, is often seen as a resumption after a summer break. Our schools and colleges have resumed too, Lord. We pray especially for those we know best. May they be vibrant, happy, safe communities within the whole community of Pennycook. May all who learn and teach within them come to find that their lives are truly enriched. Bless especially initiatives where churches or the Scripture Union have been invited to make a contribution to school life. Lord Jesus Christ, as we read the Gospel accounts, we realize that so much of your time was spent among poor and marginalized folk, and that, quoting the prophet Isaiah, you identified such folk as a priority, and you made his words part of your mission statement. So we pray now for those folk whose lives have been unfairly diminished, and demeaned in these days of ours. We remember folk struggling hard just to make ends meet, constantly fearing the next price rise. We remember folk worrying about their own or their family's future. Lord Jesus, we also realize that you spent much of your time healing as well as teaching or preaching. So give us your sense of real compassion as we pray for our National Health Service, remembering the stress experienced by all its staff and the anxiety of patients who are waiting for appointments, diagnoses or treatment. Justice too, Lord, 
was a concern expressed in your mission statement. So we pray for all parties seeking a just wage settlement across so many areas of working life. Lord, bring a reasonableness to all their negotiations and let the well-being of society somehow, somehow guide and determine their expectations. Lord, in a moment of silence, we bring you our private thoughts on all of this or other things that concern us now. Lord, it may very well be that our silent prayers have been a lament for the pain and hurt that so many folk are experiencing at home and abroad today. And we do remember that John, writing in Patmos, did bring suffering and patient endurance together as he wrote about your kingdom and its work. Nonetheless, Lord Jesus, who are limitless love in action, help us to understand the book of Revelation as your positive postlude to the whole of Scripture. Assure us that the, the Holy Spirit is ceaselessly at work on the last page of our Bible, just as he is on the first. Hear us now, Lord Jesus, as we pray together in these words that you gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, David. Our last song today is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Can I just remind you that prayer ministry is available at the back of the church if you have anything that you would like prayed for. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you always. Amen.